The title of this work has not been chosen without the grave and solid deliberation which matters of importance demand from the prudent. Even its first, or general denomination, was the result of no common research or selection, although, according to the example of my predecessors, I had only to seize upon the most sounding and euphonic surname that English history or topography affords, and elected it once as the title of my work and the name of my hero. But, alas! What could my readers have expected from the chivalrous epithets of Howard, Mordaunt, Mortimer, or Stanley, or from the softer and more sentimental sounds of Belmer, Belleville, Belfield, and Belgrave, but pages of inanity, similar to those which have been so christened for half a century past? I must modestly admit I am too diffident of my own merit to place it in unnecessary opposition to preconceived associations. I have, therefore, like a maiden knight with his white shield, assumed for my hero, Waverley, an uncontaminated name, bearing with it sound little of good or evil, excepting what the reader shall hereafter be pleased to affix to it. But my second or supplemental title was a matter of much more difficult election, since that, short as it is, may be held as pledging the author to some special mode of laying his scene, drawing his characters, and managing his adventures. Had I, for example, announced in my frontispiece, Waverley, a tale of other days, must not every novel reader have anticipated a castle scarce less than that of Udolpho, of which the eastern wing had long been uninhabited, and the keys either lost, or consigned to the care of some aged butler or housekeeper, whose trembling steps, about the middle of the second volume, were doomed to guide the hero, or heroine, to the ruinous precincts? Would not the owl have shrieked and the cricket cried in my very title page? And could it have been possible for me, with a moderate attention to decorum, to introduce any scene more lively than might be produced by the jocularity of a clownish but faithful valet, or the garrulous narrative of the heroine's fig de chamber, when rehearsing the stories of blood and horror which she had heard in the servants' hall? Again, had my title borne, Waverley, a romance from the German, what head so obtuse as not to image forth a profligate abbot, an oppressive duke, a secret and mysterious association of Rosicrucians and Illuminati, with all their properties of black cowls, caverns, daggers, electrical machines, trapdoors, and dark lanterns? Or if I had rather chosen to call my work a sentimental tale, would it not have been a sufficient presage of a heroine with a profusion of auburn hair, and a harp, the soft solace of her solitary hours, which she fortunately finds always the means of transporting from castle to cottage, although she herself be sometimes obliged to jump out of a two-pair-of-stairs window, and is more than once bewildered on her journey, alone and on foot, without any guide but a blousy peasant girl, whose jargon she hardly can understand? Or, again, if my Waverley had been entitled A Tale of the Times, Wouldst thou not, gentle reader, have demanded from me a dashing sketch of the fashionable world, a few anecdotes of private scandal thinly veiled, and if lusciously painted, so much the better? A heroine from Grosvenor Square, and a hero from the Barouche Club or the Four in Hand, with a set of subordinate characters from the Elegantes of Queen and Street East, or the dashing heroes of the Bow Street office? I could proceed in proving the importance of a title page, and displaying at the same time my own intimate knowledge of the particular ingredients necessary to the composition of romances and novels of various descriptions, but it is enough, and I scorn to tyrannize longer over the impatience of my reader, who is doubtless already anxious to know the choice made by an author so profoundly versed in the different branches of his art. By fixing, then, the date of my story sixty years before this present November 1, 1805, I would have my readers understand that they will meet in the following pages neither a romance of chivalry nor a tale of modern manners, that my hero will neither have iron on his shoulders, as of yore, nor on the heels of his boots, as is the present fashion of Bond Street, and that my damsels will neither be clothed in purple and in pall, like the Lady Alice of an old ballad, nor reduced to the primitive nakedness of a modern fashionable at a rout. From this my choice of an era the understanding critic may farther presage that the object of my tale is more a description of men than manners. A tale of manners, to be interesting, must either refer to antiquities so great as to have become venerable, or it must bear a vivid reflection of those scenes which are passing daily before our eyes, and are interesting from their novelty. Thus the coat of mail of our ancestors, and the triple-furred police of our modern bows, may, though for very different reasons, be equally fit for the array of a fictitious character, but who, meaning the costume of his hero to be impressive, 
would willingly attire him in the court dress of George II's reign, with its snow collar, large sleeves, and low pocket holes? The same may be urged, with equal truth, of the Gothic hall, which, with its darkened and tinted windows, its elevated and gloomy roof, and massive oaken table garnished with boar's head and rosemary, pheasants and peacocks, cranes and cygnets, has an excellent effect in fictitious description. Much may also be gained by a lively display of a modern fate, such as we have daily recorded in that part of a newspaper entitled The Mirror of Fashion, if we contrast these, or either of them, with the splendid formality of an entertainment given sixty years since, and thus it will be readily seen how much the painter of antique or of fashionable manners gains over him who delineates those of the last generation. Considering the disadvantages inseparable from this part of my subject, I must be understood to have resolved to avoid them as much as possible, by throwing the force of my narrative upon the characters and passions of the actors, those passions common to men in all stages of society, and which have alike agitated the human heart, whether it throbbed under the steel corslet of the 15th century, the brocaded coat of the 18th, or the blue frock and white dimity waistcoat of the present. Day, asterisk, upon these passions it is no doubt true that the state of manners and laws casts a necessary coloring, but the bearings, to use the language of heraldry, remain the same, though the tincture may be not only different, but opposed in strong contradistinction. The wrath of our ancestors, for example, was colored gules, it broke forth in acts of open and sanguinary violence against the objects of its fury. Our malignant feelings, which must seek gratification through more indirect channels, and undermine the obstacles which they cannot openly bear down, may be rather said to be tinctured sable. But the deep ruling impulse is the same in both cases, and the proud peer, who can now only ruin his neighbor according to law, by protracted suits, is the genuine descendant of the baron who wrapped the castle of his competitor in flames, and knocked him on the head as he endeavored to escape from the conflagration. It is from the great book of nature, the same through a thousand editions, whether of black letter, or wirewove and hot-pressed, that I have venturously essayed to read a chapter to the public. Some favorable opportunities of contrast have been afforded me by the state of society in the northern part of the island at the period of my history, and may serve at once to vary and to illustrate the moral lessons, which I would willingly consider as the most important part of my plan. Although I am sensible how short these will fall of their aim if I shall be found unable to mix them with amusement, a task not quite so easy in this critical generation as it was sixty years since. Asterisk alas! That attire, respectable and gentlemanlike in 1805, or thereabouts, is now as antiquated as the author of Waverley has himself become since that period. The reader of fashion will please to fill up the costume with an embroidered waistcoat of purple velvet or silk, and a coat of whatever color he pleases.